Welcome back to Your Health Television Program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm very pleased you could be with us for our next segment. For the next few minutes, I'd like to talk about plastic surgery for men. Of course, at one time, people had a conception that plastic surgery was only for women, only for Hollywood starlets. But of course, people of all ages and both genders now very frequently come to my office to discuss a change in their appearance or for plastic and reconstructive surgery. So what I'd like to do is take a few minutes and talk about the more common procedures that I do in my office, plastic surgery for men. Let's start with perhaps the most classic of all procedures, plastic surgery procedures for men, and that's correction of gynecomastia. The condition gynecomastia, gynecomastia really is abnormally enlarged breast tissue in men. It's important to note that some degree of gynecomastia is normal for some adolescents. Um, this can last for a year or two. Most boys grow out of it. If the, if the boy does not grow out of it, then that's, what we, that's, that's a time when we can consider surgical correction. And of course, gynecomastia can persist uh, well into the older ages, or it can actually have an onset as there are hormonal changes, weight changes, uh, fat and weight distribution. So it's a pretty common uh, request that I see in my office to correct the gynecomastia, which is an, an abnormally enlarged uh, breast area in the male. So how do we do that? There are essentially two ways that we do body contouring. And of course, it's the closed approach that we mainly do for gynecomastia. The two main ways we do body contouring are with the open approach and the closed approach. The open approach is where we make incisions. We can remove big blocks of skin and fat. We can tighten up muscles inside if we need to. And an example of an open approach to body contouring is a tummy tuck or abdominoplasty. The other way that we do body contouring is the closed approach. Now that's essentially liposuction. In liposuction, we make a very small incision, just long enough uh, to get in a cannula. A cannula is a tube. It's very similar to a pencil or pen, however, it can be longer. So we make it just wide enough or long enough to insert the cannula or tube. We connect that tube to a sterile hose, which goes to a suction machine. And through that cannula, I can vacuum out fat. I can vacuum out fat cells. And of course, in gynecomastia, and sometimes for women with large breasts, I can vacuum out actual breast parenchyma or breast cells. Now, we want to numb up and sort of loosen up the tissue. We like the vessels to constrict. And so I use a technique called the tumescent technique. Sometimes I use a technique called a super wet technique. That's when I numb up the skin with a needle. I inject a solution called Hunstead's formula, which is a very dilute numbing medicine with some buffer and epinephrine that helps the vessels to constrict. That way, with the use of a blunt cannula or blunt tube, we can vacuum out fat cells, vacuum out some abnormal uh, breast cells, vacuum out the fat cells, and thereby mold and shape and tailor. Of course, we try not to over-treat an area, such as in, in gynecomastia. We don't want to end, out, end up with a concave area or depressed area. We just want a more natural uh, contour so the pectoralis muscle can show, and a man may feel more comfortable putting on a jacket or shirt and tie, etc., or wearing a t-shirt. And of course, uh, a man will, or a boy will feel more comfortable taking off his shirt to get involved with gymnastics or in gym, phys ed, et cetera. And I can say honestly that it's one procedure that leads to a very high percentage of very satisfied patients. Uh, boys and men find that this procedure, to give them relief from their feeling that their breasts are abnormally large, it can really uh, lessen that feeling of being self-conscious about their chest and breast area. So that's called gynecomastia correction with the closed approach. Sometimes I'll make a small incision just under the areola. The areola is the tan part around the nipple. Sometimes to complete the recontouring and sculpting, I'll make a short incision under the areola where the tan part changes to the paler tissue 
and I'll use that to actually gain access and go in and to remove, say, a breast bud or more solid tissue that isn't coming out with the liposuction cannula. My access incision for the suctioning for gynecomastia is usually one incision where the tan changes to the white, a very small incision in the pectoral or axillary fold. That's where the arm meets the chest in the little crease there. And sometimes for some men, a short incision at the side, if they have kind of an inframammary crease or a fold in the skin, I'll make a short incision there. That way with the tube or cannula, I can cross hatch or honeycomb and really sculpt and mold and tailor the tissue very, very effectively. Perhaps the second most common uh, procedure requested by men is liposuction. The more common areas for liposuction for men are under the neck or the submentum, and of course the ever-present love handles, those areas at the lower part of the flanks. Liposuction is a similar procedure to the correction of gynecomastia with the closed approach where I make short incisions, I insert the tube or cannula, and I vacuum out fat cells. It's important to note that this procedure for small areas can be done while the person is awake in the office. For larger areas or for someone who prefers an anesthetic, we can go to the surgery center or the hospital for sedation or twilight anesthesia or even to take a nap, a general anesthetic. So even if someone is under an anesthetic, I numb up the area with the Hunstead's formula that has, a, that has some epinephrine which constricts the vessels to minimize the bleeding. The nerves are pushed aside with the blunt cannula and we can vacuum out and we can mold and shape and tailor areas of gynecomastia. Uh, we can do that for the submental area or under the chin and it's actually very effective. Uh, we can do the abdomen for men uh, the flanks, those love handles. We can give a, a man a more pleasing torso figure. And so it's really very effective in removing fat cells. Sometimes people will say to me, is liposuction permanent? Certainly the number of fat cells that we have after adolescence is relatively constant. After adolescence, as we gain weight, the fat cells that we have get bigger. As we lose weight, the fat cells we have get smaller. And so if we vacuum out those cells, they're not going to return. Certainly if we overeat or don't exercise, put on weight, the fat, the fat cells that we have that remain certainly get larger. But those fat cells that were vacuumed out don't return. So they're gone. Once they're vacuumed out, they're gone. And as I said, the number of fat cells after adolescence is relatively constant. Now before I go on to uh, the face, common procedures for men of the face, what we, what we do now is oftentimes we'll do fat grafting. Instead of just discarding that fat, we might uh, spin down the fat, centrifuge it, purify it, clean it, and we can inject that into certain areas. For example, to give a person higher cheekbones, to make the chin more prominent, to give a stronger angle of the jaw, uh, to fill up fine lines around the mouth, etc. So that fat containing stem containing stem cells can actually be very valuable and very helpful for uh, breast enlargement, sometimes for buttock enlargement, etc. So I would say that those procedures are more commonly done for men, excuse me, for women. Fat grafting is more commonly done for women, I think, but oftentimes for men as well. They can benefit by some fat grafting to certain areas of the face because as we know, as we grow older, we tend to lose weight or lose fat volume in the face and we gain it in the trunk. That's sort of a ubiquitous, it's like gravity. It just simply is there, it's a law. As we get older, we lose fat, lose weight in our face and we gain it in our trunk. So we can help with restoration or rejuvenation of the face, oftentimes by some fat transfer. And that's for, actually for men or for women. Now, for facial rejuvenation, plastic surgery of the face for men, I would say that the most common procedures involve the eyelids, the blepho that's called a blepharoplasty or eyelid tuck, and a neck lift or neck firming or neck redraping procedure. In my practice, I would say that a neck lift or what I call a natural neck lift is a much more common procedure in men than the facelift, certainly. Not all men are candidates for what we might call a facelift. Of course, everyone, everyone thinks of a facelift as something different. But in my practice, certainly a neck lift in men is a much more common operation than a facelift for a man. 
I'll mention that again. But before I do that, I want to talk about the eyelids. It's very common uh, for men and for women to get uh, redundant skin of the upper lid, excess fullness, and that can be easily addressed by something called a blepharoplasty or eyelid tuck. Now for women, I'm much more likely to recommend elevating the brow, especially a lateral brow lift. Oftentimes I'll make an incision in the temple area of the scalp and I'll go down with a little instrument like an endoscope or a fiber optic retractor and I'll elevate the lateral portion of the brow in women. That's because if you flip through the glamour magazines, you'll notice almost all of the glamour models, the females, the women will have a little peak towards the lateral or portion of the brow towards the ear. That's not that true for men. We do want a full eyelid for men, but in our society, a more horizontal or lower brow is a sign, actually it suggests virility and strength and masculinity. So I'm far less likely to elevate the brow in a man than I am in a woman. Now it's not unheard of, oftentimes a man's brow comes down so low that if I just do an eyelid surgery or just a blepharoplasty, that can be, um, it'll, it'll tend to give an incomplete result or an incomplete reconstruction for the area. So sometimes I will do a lateral brow lift, but, but more often a brow lift is done for a woman. But certainly an upper eyelid tuck, a blepharoplasty can be very effective in men and women. I tend to take more skin than the underlying fat. If someone has puffy eyelids or heavy upper lids, I'll sculpt and remove, strengthen, I'll sculpt and remove some of the fat and sometimes strengthen the, septum, sept, strengthen the septum, that's a membrane that holds the fat in place, especially for the pockets closer to the nose. We call those the medial and central pockets. So we're good at creating a crease and giving the upper lid a more youthful, more vibrant, more vibrant, more awake look. Now, in men and for women who have lower eyelid pouches, the lower blepharoplasty can be very effective. That's a lower eyelid tuck when we minimize the pouch. That tends to be more fatty deposition. The fat pouches tend to cause that much more than excess skin. Some people feel they have lots of lower eyelid extra skin, but it's mainly the fat compartments. Now, as I said, more men tend to get neck lifts in my practice than facelifts. What about the natural neck lift? Well, the natural neck lift is a systematic approach to analysis of the anatomy, leading to a custom designed approach to rejuvenating the neck area. Oftentimes, it can be simple liposuction, as I mentioned. When I, mention, when I liposuction the, the cervical area or the neck area and the submentum, I make one little incision in the submental crease. Most people have a scar there anyway. About 90% of Americans do, I think, because they fall from a bike or trip on the curb or fall down the stairs when they're a kid. I make one little incision where the earlobe meets the cheek, and through those three little incisions, I can suction out the submental area and the neck area and the cervical area to give a more crisper, tighter, firmer appearing neck. Now, for people who have extra skin, and they need skin excised, of course, that needs an incision, that, that means an incision will be made because I need to remove skin. For people who have a loose underlying platysma, that's the muscle underneath the chin and in the neck, that, that will often give bands. And most people think that that's just loose skin, but it's really the underlying platysma muscle that needs to be tightened and firmed up, and that's called a platysmaplasty. And usually I do that through a short incision in the submental crease, uh, and at that way I can gain access to the loose muscle and redrape that, tighten it and firm it. And then I can, off, and then I can come from the sides, a crease in back of the ear, using a cre the crease in back of the ear, sometimes the crease in front of the ear, to tighten the skin, bring up the muscle from the side as well. Now, there is another commonly done procedure to, to firm up or make the jawline or chin line stronger. That's with a chin, chin implant or a bony genioplasty, that's where we move the chin forward. That can be a very effective procedure for men as well as women to give a much more stronger chin and jawline, thereby, thereby really adding another dimension to the appearance of a crisp, clean neckline. So those are all components to what I call the natural neck lift, and everybody gets a custom-designed approach. If you'd like more information about this, please call my office. I'm Dr. David Morwood, 831 
646-8661 or go to my website, drmorwood.com. That's D-R-M-O-R-W-O-O-D, drmorwood.com. Thanks very much for being here. Once again, this is Your Health television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.